Hello again. In an earlier video I talked about generating force from the core of a strong and stable platform and delivering that force through relaxed arms. And I used the so-called one inch punch as an example of how to do that. And today we're going to take a look at that technique with a little bit more focus. Some people think the one inch punch is just a trick and uh, while you can use a trick to make someone fall over, it doesn't mean that every demonstration of the one inch punch is therefore a trick. The mat behind me is only four millimeters thick, but if I walk backwards and I happily catch my heel against it at the right moment, at the right angle, then I could easily trip and fall over. Now imagine instead of four millimeters, it's a 60 centimeter crash mat. Now, if someone's demonstrating a trick, uh, they could just nudge me with one finger. And let's suppose I lock my knees because I want to participate in the trick. I lock my knees, they nudge me with the finger. I hit the 60 centimeter crash mat, of course I'm going to fall over. But it's not the nudge that makes me fall over because if somebody nudges me with their finger, in reality, I'm more likely to do that, regain my footing, and come back. Same if it's a chair. It could be a crash mat, it could be a chair, it could be any other obstacle. People who only want to pull a trick will put an obstacle behind their partner, and their partner will stagger back, hit that, and fall over. It doesn't mean that every time somebody uses a chair, for example, that it, that it is a trick. If you watch the famous video of Bruce Lee using his one-inch punch against Joe Lewis, you'll clearly see that Joe Lewis is going to go arse first into the floor, chair or no chair. So when you see somebody demonstrating the so-called one-inch punch and they're using a crash mat or a chair, watch very carefully. Is it the punch that puts the person on the floor or do they trip and fall over the, the obstacle? Let's be clear, this is not a punch that's going to end a fight unless you knock your opponent clean on his arse and he realises he's outclassed and just decides to quit. It's not a punch that's going to break bones or knock somebody out. At least I can't do that. You use it to disrupt your opponent when they're already in close. Now in the street that might mean that they're already in your face before you realise it's about to kick off and your hand is here. In the ring it might mean that you're in a clinch with somebody. Either way, you're in a situation where you want to disrupt your opponent and thus give yourself time and space to follow up with a finisher. Any target that you can hit at right angles is a good target. You should also strike targets that are already close to the weapon. So if your hand happens to be here, sternum or solar plexus are good. If your hand happens to be here, ribs. If your hand happens to be here, throat. If your hand happens to be down here, knee. Notice it also doesn't need to be a fist. Hand. Elbow, shoulder, hip, knee, any weapon, any target.
As I said in an earlier video, your core generates your force. Your arm merely delivers it, doesn't generate it. So for this type of punch, it's pretty irrelevant how far your fist travels. The base of my friend Bob here is filled with 100 litres of water. That's 100 kilos. And that's 100 kilos that I have to move with the explosive force of my punch. Of course, I can move it like this. It actually requires a lot of effort for me just to push those 100 kilos. And you can see, you can hear it in my voice, that it is an effort. But that's because I'm pushing from my shoulder. Watch what happens when I use my core in an explosive way. Of course, I don't have to use my fist to deliver that kind of force. I can use the palm of my hand. I can use an elbow. I can use my shoulder. Anything that is close to a valid target at the moment that I need it. Delivering force that I generate from here. And of course, I buy myself time and space to follow up with a finisher. Do not stand side on. A, it's not necessary to generate the force, and B, if you should fail to land your punch and Bob slips past you there, he's got you at a disadvantage. And no matter what position you start off in, whether here or here, don't overextend when you throw your punch. Because again, if you fail to make it land, you risk losing your balance, you risk Bob grabbing hold of your arm and pulling you off balance, or if he slips, and he's now on your blind side, you're in this position with Bob attacking you from behind. Don't shove. Shoving means that your fist has already landed and achieved nothing, and now you're resorting to brute strength, probably using the shoulder to achieve anything at all. And this isn't a good idea, because brute strength is easier to read and therefore easier to deal with, but also it doesn't produce that shock effect that you need to disrupt your opponent. Don't step to generate the force. Stepping like that means you're not using the core to generate an explosive force that just powers out of you. Just look at the effect on Bob. Yes, I can push him, but your opponent is not a latex bomber. Your opponent can easily read that knock it to one side. It's not the same as Of course you can use a step to help you deliver the strike but you shouldn't use it to generate the force. Don't put your weight forward. A. It's unnecessary and B. It leaves you in a vulnerable position should you fail to land your shot. Do stand square on as much as possible with your weight back. That gives you more control. And it doesn't matter whether your feet are equidistant from your opponent. Punching off the front foot. Punching off the rear foot. You don't even have to be directly facing your opponent. You could be off to one side. You could be completely to the side. As I don't currently have a partner that I can demonstrate this on, here's a clip of my friend Alan, who does it a lot better than I do. Okay, so first off, I'm just going to demonstrate a one-inch punch. A one inch punch comes from the bottom leg. It drives through the hips, it uses Newton's second law, for those of you who know. You relax my arm, 
And I move. How heavy are you? Uh, 130. Okay. <laughs> right, again. So one inch punch, my stance comes from the leg through the hips and push it. Okay? What I'm not doing is leaning forward and pushing. You see a lot of techniques where people do this. It's not about that. What I want to do is create the impact. If it's done right, watch these hips. These hips move first because the weight's going through. Okay? Now the idea of a one-inch punch isn't just to stand there and knock somebody on their ass. It's part of a process. So let's say, for instance, Pete throws a big loop in, right hand in, and I block it, okay? So the first thing I'm going to do as he throws it in is I want to make sure I'm stopping and his shoulders are starting to move. Now his hips are up because he's driving in for the punch. Now I drop in the one-inch punch and I'm going to move him. So as he comes in and throws that fast, what I've done is been able to move him slightly. Now, it doesn't stop there. So he comes in and throws that punch, I move him, then I go through with the rest of my techniques and make sure I'm hitting all the points. So it's not just about me dropping him, but it's about me being able to drop the power in through his body and down and out through so that I move the guy. Okay? Make sense? Yeah. I like it as well. It's not a trick, it's a strike. It's a disrupting shot, not a finishing shot. Keep your weight back. Don't twist into it. Strike whatever target happens to be available. You don't have to use your fist. Thanks for watching.